You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Ivan, go ahead and get us started. I was definitely downgraded from the awesome co-host in this like, second episode, but that's okay. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Amy. Amy St. Arnaud is a business partner in two full-service veterinary clinics, Community Pet Care Clinic in Ohio and Open Door Veterinary Care in North Carolina that focus on removing barriers to care and increasing access to veterinary services while still maintaining a net positive revenue. She has created a nonprofit mentorship training called Open Door Veterinary Collective for clinics that want to replicate their business model, including giving back through their revenue, providing a variety of payment support options that can increase practice revenue, providing spectrum of care in treatment plans and creating strong community partnership with human social service and animal Nonprofits. Amy, thank you so much for finding the time. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm very excited for this episode because so we had a um, chat before when Sean missed our recording. And uh, <laughs> we, but this is a big thing that we're trying to do at Galaxy. So essentially, we want to increase access to care to people when and, and uh, where they needed with their pets. And um, economic situation sometimes prevents us from delivering the service that we want and uh, also increasing the economic euthanasia, which I believe is a significant factor in burnout as well for veterinarians. Well, at least it was for me. So very excited to, to kind of get into it. But um, let's just kind of start there. What uh, what inspired you to create two different business models and how do they support each other if they do and what was the inspiration behind it so my background is in nonprofit grant funding and running large high volume spay neuter and training programs through the aspca and pet smart charities and one of the things that we really found was how important it was to provide training and mentorship and a network for people to be able to implement new things and one of the things that we find is too often practices are forced into these difficult choices with client finances are an issue So you either have to turn the pet away with no care, you have to give the services away, which isn't sustainable, you have to have the pet surrender to you, which breaks the human animal bond, or you have to perform economic euthanasia. None of these feel good for anybody. We believe that this is what leads to burnout in the field. So my business partners and I started with this question because we knew what we were doing in nonprofit, but we wanted to see, could we have the mission and money within private practice? Because there's 30,000 private practices out there. There's not enough nonprofits to do all this work. So meaning, can we help ensure that all people and pets get access to care and still make sure that we're getting paid for our services and make a profit? Because profit isn't a dirty word. We need to have a profit to be around and provide these services. So for us, the answer is yes. So we found that we've been able to make anywhere from 5% to 20% net revenue, depending on our staffing levels, and be able to still help people. It's so fascinating. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And so, you know, you, so you've, you've seen this issue in your business. Um, you've got this background in nonprofit and you're like, there's got to be a better way. So when you when you said that to yourself, there's got to be a better way. How did this journey start? How has it been going and where are you at today? So we actually started our two practices, the one in Ohio and the one in North Carolina. And so they are full service general practices. And so there's three partners who are involved in it. And we, from there, when once we'd had been able to do these, so one's been open for four years and one for six, once we saw that we could actually make a profit and that we felt like we had enough that we could share with others, that's when I started the nonprofit of the Open Door Veterinary Collective. And so our goal is we want to share this with other practices. We don't want to keep this to ourselves. We want to show them how they can do this in any type of practice. It doesn't matter what type of practice they have. And it is not, doesn't feel like it's too hard to do. So we offer, we have pro bono one-on-one consults that we do thanks to Maddie's fund. And we're launching an online access to care certification program in January, where any member of a team will be able to go through this and get uh, certified. And what it's going to be able to do is really help them learn how to put these things into their practices. Because one of the biggest challenges that we have seen is overcoming that dreaded money talk. Because let's be honest, no one wants to have to talk about money, but that's probably the number one thing that's causing the most unnecessary pain between clients and vet teams right now. Because it used to be that all of our clients could afford and they would opt into whatever treatment plan we recommended. 
But now we're starting to see that the cost of vet meds impacting everyone. And maybe people aren't doing those routine dentals and they aren't getting a year's worth of flea and tick or they're declining more of your recommendations. And it doesn't mean they don't want to do these things, but they're making more choices based on finances. So this is where we're really seeing because a lot of practices are saying, well, I've been so busy. I don't, I don't need to, to get clients who can't afford to pay. And you may think, well, this doesn't really impact us, but it's getting harder and harder. We're seeing two thirds of Americans are now financially fragile meaning that they can't come up with $2,000 in 30 days for an unexpected expense. 30% of those are middle income, 20% are high income. And the synchrony study found a $250 bill can cause financial stress. So that, that's kind of where we're at. And I hear people say, well, if you can't afford a pet, you shouldn't have one, but pets shouldn't be a luxury. So what is the this? What do you teach people and how did you learn it yourself? Well, so what we actually teach people is because we really started seeing how much pain there was in the veterinary field and seeing that what's happening is kind of this vicious circle of where people were coming in, they were getting declined for care credit. That might be the only thing that a, that a clinic offers, but nationwide, only 40% of people are approved. And at our clinic, we only see about 20%. So what do we do with those people once they're declined? That's all we offer. And a lot of clinics have not done payment plans because they've been burned and they, they find that that isn't working. So now you have to either turn that client away. The client gets mad. They go do a negative Google review or, or say your money grubbing vet, which we know is not true. We know that vets, you know, have traditionally been underpaid and are finally just starting to change that around now. So, you know, it, it just it causes this rift between the clients and the clinic and the pets stuck in the middle. So that was the biggest thing that we saw. And that a lot of times it was really just that the money conversation was ruining the relationship. So we saw that while we can continue to live in this pain and see more vets leave the field and struggle with the mental bur burden, or we can do something because we really think a lot of this conflict could be addressed if we just change what payment support options we offer and how we have the money conversation. So the first thing that we do is we talk about having a financial triage plan for your clinic knowing what you're going to do when you run into the people who can't afford to pay, what's going to happen. And this doesn't have to be taking on new clients. It's going to be your existing clients only, because we know that there are going to be a lot of people who can afford to pay, but just not up front. They can afford to pay over time. So if we did offer them to be able to pay it over three to six months, they're going to do it. So what we do is we have an entire financial tree of like 14 different options. Of if somebody's declined for care credit, what about scratch pay? That doesn't work. What about Verity? What about vet billing? And it goes all the way down to we have a stay together fund. And we put $1 from every healthy pet exam into that fund. And then our veterinary team gets to use that money. And they have a certain amount each quarter that they get to use for clients in need to help as they see fit. So it really helps them feel empowered. They get to say yes instead of having to say no. And what we find is that when we mix and match all of these programs, that we can actually help people get the care they need. And again, we don't have to turn them away. So one of the biggest ones we use is a payment plan. And I know a lot of people feel like that's that's bad, but we actually have had great success with it and we show people how we've done it. So having these options, having the financial triage is number one. Number two is removing the stigma of talking about financials. So we right off the bat, it's on our website, it's on our forms, it's, we talk about it in the phone, we have it in our lobby, in the exam rooms we're always talking about what options there are for support. And we make sure that our, our team knows how to have those conversations and what terms to use. And then the payment plans. So, you know, we, we studied six years worth of vet billing data and we recently published an article in Frontiers Journal and nationwide we found that there's a 93% approval rating. So that debunks this thought of you're going to get burned. Yes, that does mean that there is still a 6.9% default, but I see so many clinics who are giving away services right now, 50 to $100,000, and this could actually mitigate that. I guess, Amy, what you've put into your nonprofit is all of this like thought around training for the people that need this information, that that money conversation is like literally, you know, it turns into donating money or taking it off the bottom line. You're teaching people how to have those hard conversations. Is that what you're doing at the nonprofit? Absolutely. Yes, that that's exactly what we're doing is how to have the conversation so that you don't have to give everything away, but you can actually still get paid by setting up a payment plan and a perfect place to start for people who are concerned about this is with dentals. Because we're seeing a lot of people not get dentals until it's at that grade four garbage mouth and there's, nobody wants to do those dentals. And then, of course, those are going to be the most expensive. 
So we started offering payment plans. We saw another clinic doing this in New York. We started offering the payment plans and we actually share with them at the time we go over the, the dental estimate and we share with them what it would be if they did it through care credit, through vet billing, through any of our payments and what their payments would be. And we actually found, and this clinic in New York actually found a 30% increase in their dental revenue. So we actually think we're going to turn this on its head that payment plans, instead of actually like hurting you and burning you, can actually increase your practice's revenue. That's something that I think a, a lot of people don't think of. It might sound controversial, but we're actually seeing that when we do payment plans with a third party provider like a vet billing, um, who's managing it for you so you don't have to do the setup and the collections and you don't have to worry about that. They manage everything for you. If you do it well and follow their guidelines, you can actually have a lot of success and get your clients to accept more of the treatment plans, be able to afford more of the care. And that just, that builds that relationship back. That's very interesting. It's sort of like leading with, uh, you're, you're truly preventing the emergency, uh, let's say with the dental, you're preventing that emergency to happen in the future by providing structured payment of preventative care in advance, which is, which is super cool. So it's essential, let me simplify this. If I'm buying, you know, right now I see it a lot in the airline tickets, which we didn't used to see, you know, if I'm buying a ticket to Florida, you know, I'm buying it for like 700 bucks because I'm in the middle of nowhere. And, <laughs> and, uh, but it shows me or six, you know, $83 payments or, or something like that. So, so essentially that's what you're doing. You're, you're kind of saying, look, your dog needs or cat needs this. And then, but it doesn't have to be a $700 hit. It could be as easy as these sort of payments. Is that what, what it's kind of like? Yeah. So you can spread it out. So it can be three months, six months or nine months. We do find that the longer they go, the more affordable because they can afford that payment a month. It's hard to afford a $300 a month payment. So when we spread that out, they're more likely to. And it's interesting because this is something that just really hit me is that vet care is one of the few areas that we expect the service up front. If you look at everybody's website, what do they say is they say payment is due at the time of service. But 70% of millennials are living paycheck to paycheck. They're now the largest pet owning population. They're used to options. They are used to Venmo and Apple Pay. They finance their phones, their clothes, their TV. So why are we one of the only fields that still has not come on board with how to finance? If we, if we want to really be able to help more people, that's something we got to crack. Yeah. Now everybody's on sub subscription, you know, Netflix, Spotify, you're, you're on everything you are doing that. So that's interesting. You're providing this proactive sort of planning for them. Now, which is a different angle. You know, we're, we're implementing membership model, which is slightly different. You know, there was, there was wellness plans. That's a different model. And now you're providing this interesting angle to it. And I totally see, do you have any data to sort of say that we were able to grow you know, a particular service by implementing this. I know you mentioned 30% growth in Dell, which is insanely successful. So is there, are there any, any other services that you can give an example to our listeners to say, you can do it with dentals, you can do it with, you know, X, Y, Z, or do you do it with all? Like, is it everything that you provide just has that breakdown in the monthly payments? So we started with dentals just to see if we could prove that. And so Lake Road, which is the, the clinic in New York that did this, they, they did prove that we had similar success in terms of dentals. So we just started, I don't have enough data yet because we've just been doing it for over a month. We started with preventative care now because we're seeing a lot of our clients coming in and maybe getting one month of flea and tick or one month of heartworm preventative. And then we knew that that was a big risk that if either they weren't coming back for that or they forgot. So we actually started setting up a payment plan where they can now pay it off over four months, but get a year's worth of supply. So I don't have enough data yet, but I think that's going to be an area to watch, but you can do it in any way, shape or form. So a lot of times if people only wanted to use it for surgeries, you so what's nice about vet billing is they offer a couple of different options. So you can set up a payment plan for your clients. So that could just be, say, they have a surgery that needs a pyometra that needs to be done. You set it up for paying off over four, six months, whatever you want to do. You can also do pay in advance where if somebody comes in and they know they need a dental and they're going to need it in three months and they want to set up, they can start making payments in advance. And then when they come in, that's paid off. They offer wellness plans to administer if you want to do that. And then they also offer pet savings plans so that you could start actually saving money if you have if you realize what this is and you want to start putting five dollars a month in or maybe your employer starts giving a pet benefit and they start putting money into your pet savings or maybe you ask your friends to venmo something in so there's all these ways that this can be used in a really creative setting that is going to help people get that care help us still get paid and not have to just give everything away 
and have that difficult conversation. And so when we show people how to have this conversation throughout within the room, it starts to take away that stigma and you start to find that you can even figure people are starting to tell you that they have financial issues without even telling you. So when they say things like, I just lost my job, I've had a health scare, those are opportunities for us right then and there to talk about that. Because right now people are turning down more of our options. We can increase that revenue. No, that's that's fascinating. I want to shift gears a little bit into the nonprofits uh, and tax advantage conversation. Do you utilize that in the model at all? So essentially, because you say that you're donating a dollar from every exam to the foundation. Do you see a sort of a successful cycle of donating towards the foundation, then foundation helping back to support the billing, then benefiting on both billing the full amount to the client rather than discounting, as well as getting the tax benefit. Is there a cycle in there? So we actually keep ours two completely separate. Our nonprofit is completely separate from our for profits. The money does not go. Our $1 that we get back into our stay together fund is just through our, our for profit. And the reason we kept those separate is because we heard a lot of times from the nonprofit side, for profits and private practices feeling like nonprofits were coming in and, and stealing the revenue and having unfair tax advantages. So we wanted to see if we could do this solely as a private practice with no support from a nonprofit. So our nonprofit is only showing people how to do this and getting grant money to make that service free to clinics that we're showing. But our private practices are all run just as any other general practice would be. We've just made the decision to put that money into that fund and, and give back ourselves. We do run if anybody wants to donate into our fund. Uh, we run and they need a tax donation. We run it through the Veterinary Care Foundation because they're set up as a nonprofit to already help nonprofits do this. So we run everything through them if somebody wants to donate in. That's been really, um, but I think that people like to come to our clinics because they see that we have that give back and they want to come to a place where they see that are doing that. It's no different than like Bamba socks, you know, that you buy the socks because you buy a pair, they're giving a pair to, to an unsheltered person. So similar model. That's really cool. Uh, for those that are sitting on the edge of their seat and wanting to learn about this, how do they go through your training? Where do they find you? What are the uh, what is the website? How do we do that? Yeah, so we've got two really interesting opportunities. So our website is opendoorconsults.org. And you can come there and contact us through there. We do have the pro bono one-on-one. -on -one. We're about to launch this online course. But we also have a really interesting option right now. We are looking for 20 practices. So we're looking for ERs, general practice, um, to be able to participate in a study for one year where if you sign on to take on payment plans and start using them in your practice, we will cover any defaults. So there will be no risk to you at all. So if somebody doesn't pay, oh, wow. you will still get paid to participate in this study. We'll train your staff on how to have these conversations because we really want to put our money where our mouth is. We believe that this is possible. We believe that this is part of the future of, of vet med. So we want to give people risk-free opportunity. So if anybody out there wants to be involved in this research and be a part of this, contact us through the website as well. Amy, it's it's truly innovative, the work that you're doing. And I know that Ivan has a burning question, but I just wanted to compliment you on, and just say that, you know, it's this idea of innovation. Often people think of just technology, but what you're doing with skills and bringing them back to people that really need them to like get rid of these dreaded conversations is just amazing. So thanks for doing it. And Ivan, go ahead. I have no tech skill, so I had to find something. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just want to say, can 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 we join? I, I want to join that program. So if we uh, and Galaxy, if we can if we can do that, I, I would love to uh, to learn from you and from your experience, because that's fascinating what you're doing and where we're huge supporters of all of this, this kind of initiative. So so let's talk off camera how we can join you in that. And then uh, for everybody who is excited and want to be a part of it, please feel free to contact Amy. We'll have all the contact information in the in the footnotes for for, for this podcast. Um, at the same time, we've burned through our time. We usually do it very fast, and today uh, it's gone faster than usual. Uh, so uh, we usually ask two questions at the end of the show. Is there a book, TED Talk, or anything that inspired you recently that you would like to share with the listeners? The book Upstream by uh, Dan Heath, because it really talks about, we get stuck in this cycle of response, and we're always kind of putting out fires, and we stay downstream. And when you go upstream, that's where you really start to find some of the actual solutions. So it's, it's no different than, you know, a, 
the analogy is a guy saw a child falling into the river downstream and he had a friend pull that child out. Then they see another one, then another one. It starts to become overwhelming. The first guy starts to leave and his friend says, where are you going? He says, I'm going upstream to figure out why they keep falling in. We're falling in and drowning in the cost of vet med and requiring all payment at the type of service. So that's why I love that book. Awesome. And then the last question for you, Amy, is another guest that you think would be awesome for us to have on the show. I think Catherine Pollack, um, she's at the Humane Society International and she works a lot on international issues, particularly um, in Asia. And she's just amazing in terms of what she does and how she really makes us think. And, and she's, uh, I, I think she'd bring a, a lot of interest about what's going on outside of the United States. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.